and uh, welcome to the 2021 Select Board Candidates. I'm calling it a question and answer. Uh, my name is David Williams. I'm moderator of Johnson's various town meetings, and um, I've been asked to moderate this uh, Q&A session. Uh, and so first of all, I'd like to go over the, the rules of the road for us today. Um, all participants, uh, when they want to speak, uh, have to introduce themselves. We are uh, required by law to record this meeting because it's a selectman's meeting. Uh, and it becomes impossible to tease out who is speaking if the person hasn't identified themselves prior to the time they start speaking. And that is true even if you've spoken, somebody else has spoken, and then at some point it comes back to you, you still have to introduce yourself for the purpose of uh, creating a record that is uh, compliant with, with the statute. Um, there are three ways that folks can par participate in this uh, meeting. <clears throat> One is uh, on the screen that we have here, and uh, there should be a, a block like somewhere on the right-hand side of the uh, your screen, uh, which has a blue hand symbol. And uh, if you wish to be recognized to speak, you would click on that. Uh, Brian is going to keep track of who's asked to speak and in what order. And uh, we will um, recognize, I will recognize people from that list uh, on Brian's prompting. Once that happens, uh, Brian will unmute uh, the microphone of the person who has just been recognized. Uh, Brian tells me that it can take a few seconds for the process of finding the speaker and then uh, unmuting his or her microphone. Uh, so it may take a few seconds uh, before uh, your comments are audible to all. Uh, and then when that speaker is finished, uh, the uh, Brian will uh, re-mute the uh, microphone of the person who was speaking. Um, the second means of participating in this is by telephone. And I've seen some telephone numbers uh, on the screen here. Uh, if a person who is on the phone wishes to speak, they should press star nine. Uh, and uh, once uh, that person has been recognized, um, they would have to press star six in order to open the microphone so that they can be heard uh, by the other people. Um, and again, there may be a slight delay as the, the counts are kind of sought out and the, the correct things done with a computer to make the microphone live for the person on the phone. And the third way uh, that uh, someone can participate uh, is on chat. And down at the bottom uh, of your screen, you'll see a chat symbol, a little white bubble. We already got one uh, person who has uh, put something in the chat box. And uh, uh, we have disabled chat. You have disabled chat, okay? There are two ways to participate in this meeting. Um, and uh, I've covered them both. Um, <laughs> I'm also informed that if uh, you didn't clean up your house before you got on the television here or for some other reason, you don't want either yourself or your immediate environment to be seen uh, there is a method for turning off the uh, video, which I think is on the bottom line over on the left side, which says stop video. And if you click on that, um, you're, you're still a participant, but uh, your face and your immediate environment will not be uh, visible to the rest of us. Um, 
Now, the objective of this meeting uh, is for all of us to learn more about the candidates. There are two sets of candidates, one for the three-year term select person and one for the two-year term select person. Uh, it is not the purpose of this meeting to tell other people who are on this uh, Zoom meeting what any particular participant thinks about any of the candidates. Again, the, the, the purpose is to inquire of the candidates as to what they think, not to uh, present a participant's opinion. Uh, personal attacks on a candidate, uh, on their character, their motivations will not be tolerated. Uh, and uh, the same goes for the use of profanity or vulgarity. Uh, I ask you to limit your questions uh, to two minutes in length. Uh, and depending upon uh, how the meeting rolls on here, I may uh, end up asking the uh, candidates to limit their, uh, their answers. But uh, for the moment, uh, I'll leave it up to the candidates themselves to exercise uh, their um, sound discretion in limiting the uh, time they have, they're gonna give for an answer. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Eric and uh, I think he has some words of introduction and some commentary. Eric? Yep, thank you, Dave. Uh, my only role tonight will be uh, introducing and welcoming the candidates, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge the two current select board members who are, have opted not to run for re-election, re and they have a little over a week left in the role, but I want to thank them for their many years of service, and that would be Doug Moldy and, and Kyle News. Thank you both. And just for good measure, we threw in a vicious dog hearing last night, so they're not getting out of this easy. Uh, I, I would like to say it is refreshing to see uh, interest being taken in these positions and serving the community and uh, having two contested elect, uh, elections, is it, it is refreshing to see, as well as uh, all of the candidates have a little bit less of the gray stuff on them. So it's good to see uh, the younger ones as well. And with that, uh, I'd like to first of all welcome the two candidates for the three-year position, Beth Foy and Michelle French. Best of luck to both of you. For the two-year position, Sophia Burrard and Eben Patch. Welcome to both of you and best of luck to both of you. And with that, I'll throw it back over to Dave. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I'm going to take about two minutes to uh, repeat a story I've told at town meeting for many years, and probably most of you have heard it before, but uh, I'm going to repeat it for you again. Uh, I go back to the town meeting, I think it was 2004, 2005, sometime in that vicinity, where uh, an article appeared under other business on the warning was a petition opposing the Iraq war. Uh, at the time, needless to say, this was an extremely hot topic with many folks being strongly committed to one side of that proposition or the other. Uh, turned out the lion's share of the argument on that point or the discussion as it went back and forth uh, were between a woman who opposed the war and a man whose son was in the theater of battle in Iraq and who believed that his son's service commanded the community's support for the war. Uh, after much argument back and forth, the meeting approved the petition opposing the war, and with that, the meeting adjourned. Thereafter, the man and the woman who had argued this case with considerable passion left the hall side by side in thoughtful and respectful conversation. Uh, this is what happens when, a, when as a community and when we individually uh, have our better angels working on us. 
and I hope we can proceed with this meeting in the same spirit. The I have four questions that have been uh, proposed. Uh, my question, I guess, to the candidates is, um, have you seen the four questions? Okay, I have nodding heads all around. So I am going to ask each candidate to attempt within, let's say, a five minute time period uh, to um, answer the four questions. And I guess we'll start with the three year uh, candidates and uh, start with uh, Beth Foy. Thanks, David. Um, so just so everyone knows who the four questions are, I'm just going to read them. Um, what's your name and how long have you lived in Johnson? What's your day job? Why are you uh, uniquely qualified to serve? And what is your greatest opportunity or challenge for the town? Um, so um, I, my maiden name is Beth Hill. Um, I grew up, I've lived in Johnson my whole life with the exception of about two years, maybe three um, in my early twenties when I lived in the Burlington area. Um, so I know a lot about Johnson <laughs> and the people in it. Um, my day job, I am a project manager for Vermont Mutual Insurance Company um, and also a member of the leadership team within the IT department, um, which <laughs> comes with many challenges as you can imagine. Um, and why I'm uniquely qualified to serve. Um, I'm very familiar with board structure. Um, I've served in a number of um, ways between school boards or committees or um, my personal interest of coaching. Um, it takes a team effort. I'm very much a team player. Um, <laughs> my mother may not say so, who's on the call, but, <laughs> but I am uh, when it comes to getting things done. Um, I have a lot of leadership experience and I really am interested in making data-driven decisions. I think that whenever you're making a really important decision, you need to have some facts to back that up. Um, and I also think that it's really important to hear all sides, whether you agree with all sides or not, um, and, and have the willingness to work through those different perspectives and put yourself in somebody else's shoes um, so that you can better understand uh, what you're all trying to accomplish together, because often it is a matter of um, perspective or, or logistics or something else, um, but it's not necessarily that you're not on the same page. So I think that's a really important piece um, and maybe the most critical piece to uh, being a successful candidate on a board. Um, and I'm, you know, obviously very committed to the town of Johnson. Um, I care about Johnson economics. I care about Johnson vitality. Um, I'm a big proponent for the NVU and all the NVU brings to our community and it needs to bring more to our community and we need to help it thrive. Um, I very much understand the issues around our internet service and the lack thereof. Um, and you know, we, the reality is we probably don't have people joining this call right now because of some of the issues around internet service. So that's really important. Um, not just because of the pandemic we're in, but it's important for our sustainability as a community and as a town and as a village and our ability to bring business in. Um, I also think that I'm very qualified for the seat because um, I'm pretty well-rounded. I, I am a generalist by nature and I like to touch a whole bunch of different things um, and understand impacts that, um, are important and the and be very critical in the way you consider the decisions you make. Um, and by you, I just mean general thought process. Um, so I think those are a lot of the ways that I'm uniquely qualified. And I've been listening into the board meetings for quite some time now. And Eric warned me probably a year or two ago that if I keep attending, I'm probably going to run. <laughs> so uh, here I am. And the other thing that um, I think is a really important question, which is the last one, which is what is the greatest opportunity or challenge for our town? Our town has lots of challenges. Um, I think we all see them every day. 
And probably the biggest challenge that we are faced with collectively, um, well, challenges, there's a couple. One is the internet problem. It is a problem. We need to fix it. The other is we all know that our downtown and our village um, business and activity in the village area um, has diminished over the past 20, 30, 40 years, probably 30 years. Um, we need to do something and really commit to that. Um, I don't have the answers necessarily, but I'm definitely willing to dig in and um, and try to find them. And there's never gonna be one answer. There always has to be multiple answers that um, basically lead to the bigger um, delivery of making our town more viable. Um, and lastly, um, I mentioned this a little bit before, but I also think the greatest opportunity and challenge both is for some really hot topics we have happening right now and will continue to have in the future um, that we have the ability to compromise on those um, uh, divisive issues. Um, it is critical for us moving forward um, and we need to walk away from hot conversations where everyone is very emotional um, and take a rational look at them. Um, and Could you wrap frankly, it bring in 30 seconds, please. Sure. And bring in the people who understand them best and go back to making those data driven decisions. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle French. Hi there. Um, Michelle French, obviously, is my name. I've lived in Johnson my entire life. Um, raised all of my kids here and have, have never actually really wanted to venture far away. I enjoy the community that I live in and I think it's a, a great place to be. And it used to be a really great place to raise kids and I wanna to continue to see it that way. Um, I am an office manager at Green Mountain Support Services in Morseville. And I have not been on any boards or any such things because well, I, worked full time and raised my three kids and chose to spend my time doing that. And now that they're all grown and for the most part on their own, I feel like I can actually commit to something and make a difference. Um, why am I uniquely qualified to serve? Um, besides living here my whole life and raising my family here, um, I, I just, I kind of want to focus on things that will bring the businesses back into our town because um, you know, I've watched so many fail, come in and leave and fail. And it, with the college and the art studio, although now is a little different with COVID, but even before this happened, there, there just shouldn't be a reason why we can't maintain a, a good business here in town. Um, I don't really have, I guess, what I want to say, a personal agenda as far as being on here. I just want to do what's best for the town. I'm a good listener. I'm open. I can communicate and get along with anyone and everyone, if need be, at any time. Um, and I guess that's that's pretty much why. I'm just interested in helping out the town, and I think I have a lot to offer. Um, greatest opportunity and challenge, and that just goes right back to the infrastructure and businesses in town. Um, creating things for families to do in town because there, there's really not a lot here. I mean, there there is the skate park um, in the winter. There's the ice skating rink, and those are wonderful. But there's definitely not enough things to keep the the kids in the community or even families together busy. And when you have stuff that everybody can kind of join and, and do together, you have less crime, you have less drugs, you have less less of the things that nobody really wants in a community. Um, and that's important to me. Um, opportunity, I guess, you know, I just, I feel like we're such a small, tight-knit town. Um, I want to find the camaraderie that I used to feel growing up here because it sometimes, it somehow seems like lately, I feel like there's more of a sense of divide than there is a working together with your neighbor. And that's, that's not what I want to see. That's not how I feel Johnson should be viewed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, just a second. Uh, St <clears throat> Sophia Berard. Hi. 
I'm oh. Sophia Berard. Um, I have lived in Johnson for 15 years about, um, but I was born and raised in Vermont um, between St. Albans and Barton. I kind of landed right in the middle in Johnson. I came here for school and just stayed ever since. The community um, really just um, just was, was one that I wanted to be a part of. So um, my husband and I bought our home here about a year and a half ago and we're raising our kid here. So we are definitely invested in this town. Um, what is my day job? I am a stay at home mother to my son, Cosimo. He's three and a half. I'm also a full-time graduate student at NVU Johnson for mental health counseling. And in the spring and summer, I landscape and garden part-time. Um, let's see, why am I uniquely qualified to serve? I'm already an active member of the community. I'm on the Tuesday Night Live committee. I'm on the Johnson Oven Community Oven Committee. Uh, before the pandemic, I was working with the Recreation Committee to um, revitalize tumble time for um, all the kids in town. And then that got shut down um, last March. And um, I'm also working with a couple community members to bring a Johnson Pottery Co-op into town. So that's in the early stages. Um, let's see, I also feel like I bring a wide range of experiences to any endeavor and I'm able to adapt and adjust my skills to whatever task uh, presents itself. In the past, I've been a baker, I've worked in the sugar woods, I've done housekeeping, I garden. And I also managed an executive office as the president's assistant at the Vermont Studio Center, um, which was uh, definitely an incredible experience to work with Gary and kind of build the position from the ground up and just learn by doing. Um, and so I feel like whatever the job may be, I operate from a creative and thoughtful perspective and I have a strong work ethic and a collaborative spirit. Also, I'm going to school to be a professional active listener, which is a skill I believe applies directly to all aspects of life and work where communication within relationships, both personal and professional is essential. Um, so I look forward to bringing my authenticity to the select board. Um, what do I see as the greatest opportunity slash challenge for the town? Um, I agree. I think businesses in town, um, I think Main Street needs a little bit of love. I do think we have a lot of great things going on already. We have Moog's Joint, we have Johnson Kitchen, we have the Village Emporium, we have Ebenezer Books. I mean, we do have, we still have a wonderful little thing going on for ourselves on Main Street. So um, I definitely am still proud of, of this town and, and all of the businesses that we have. Um, I kind of meshed my opportunity and challenge into one, um, just thinking of the rail trail and how it's up and running now in Johnson and how there's so much, there's such an opportunity um, and a challenge to reimagine the land around the rail trail and how we could potentially develop it into a vibrant extension of our downtown to attract visitors off of the rail trail. Um, I know there've been studies conducted about some potential locations down that way. And I think it would be worth re-examining those studies to see if there are some viable options. I think there's wonderful untapped potential in that part of town to round out Johnson as a unique and welcoming destination point. So thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin Patch. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Evan Patch. Uh, as far as how long I've lived in Johnson, I was born and raised in this town. Um, on my, my shortest side of my parents uh, would be fourth generation in this town. So I've been around here for a while. Uh, I work at a company in Essex called Temperature Controls of Vermont, where we design building automation systems uh, to to custom specs pretty much for every building. I mean, we did Johnson Elementary School and it's funny that you work at uh, VMI, Beth. <laughs> I did that building too, but um, mostly HVAC controls, uh, some lighting, some door access, but and a little bit of process controls, but 
I'm a manager for that company. I started out as an engineer and worked my way up the ranks there. Uh, the third question is, why are you uniquely qualified to serve? Um, being in a management position, uh, meeting people in the middle and compromise is something I have to do on a daily basis. And I think it's something the town really, really needs. Uh, also, I, I'm personally vested in this town, uh, wanting to keep my children here so that another generation can grow up in this town and another generation. Uh, my family has done a lot for the town in the past, so I guess it's kind of a calling for me. Um, you know, the pizza oven went in and some topsoil needed to be removed. Relative that did that, uh, the trailhead building needed to be built. I was part of that team when the rec fields went in. I was there <laughs> as a child, probably not doing much. Um, so it, just generations of my family have been a part of this town. Uh, my grandmother served on the planning commission. My mother was on the rec committee. Um, so community service and wanting to keep the town a good place to live and a good place to raise your children uh, is just deeply in my roots. Um, I also would really like to keep it a financially affordable place to live. I think something that's really important is ensuring uh, new gravel uh, for our roads because that could get pretty pricey for taxpayers. I'd really like to see more businesses come here. Um, I've, I've seen them move out left and right and, uh, growing up and it's kind of sad. Um, what, what are the greatest opportunities and challenges or challenge for the town? I'd say there's a lot of opportunities and challenges uh, for sure. Um, probably the greatest opportunity and challenge would go hand in hand, and I would say that's the people. Uh, we can get a lot done uh, if we kind of work together and meet in the middle on, on stuff, um, but that's also the biggest challenge for, you know, wanting to meet in the middle and stuff. Um, there's other opportunities. Uh, I'd like to say, you know, the industrial park is an opportunity. We're going to need the state's help getting that one off the ground. Uh, that would be a great spot to bring some more business to this town so that we could have some paying jobs for residents to work at. Um, and I, I'm kind of worried about the failing infrastructure that's happening around here. And I'd like to be on a proactive stance with that instead of a reactive stance. And I know that there's a middle ground there too where you go to meet, but uh, hopefully that tells you a little bit about myself and my interests for the town. Thank you very much. Now, at this point, I think we uh, would open this up to uh, questions from the floor. Brian, do you have any blue hands up? I don't have any hands up yet. All right, we've got one now. Uh, they're starting to come in. A uh, reminder, if you are on the telephone and want to raise your hand, it's uh, star nine. Do you see the list on your screen, Dave, or do you want me to call them in order? Uh, I do not have them on my screen at this point. Okay, so uh, I've got them in order, so I, I can tell you who we've got up first. Uh, the first is uh, Eric Hutchins. Okay. Your mic's on. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for doing this, for everyone who participated and made this possible. I think it's a great thing to do during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, uh, my first question is, you know, obviously all four of you have a position, I imagine, on the uh, ATV ordinance and the items, the non-binding binding, binding items on the on the town ballot but my question for you isn't your position on that but if you are going and plan to respect the will of the voters um article 13 and article 14 the town gets to weigh in on what they think you know in our small democratic society as a as a town select board member would you vote to follow the will of the people on the atv ordinances or would you vote your own uh conscience and discretion on those issues.
guess uh, I would recommend we let's go backwards from the order we first ran and have uh, Evan, you want to pick that up? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm on muting and unmuting yeah. myself here. I can. Um, I, can I mean, as an elected official, I think your job is to uphold the will of the voters. Um, so there would have to be. <laughs> yes, you're not asking for the view. I guess you're kind of asking for a yes or a no. There you go. Okay. Uh, Sophia? Yeah, I would say absolutely. Listen to the will of the voters. Michelle? Uh, well, I guess if I'm voted in by the folks from the town and their will is what they want, then I really have no other choice but to go with it because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be elected. So that's my answer. Huh? Yeah, my answer is I would absolutely go with the will of the voters. And I just want to add on that um, I am not super passionate either way about the ATV. I'll just be completely honest with everyone. Um, and I think that even though it's a, a non-binding vote and the select board will be making a decision on it, we do need to go with the will of the voter, the voters. Um, I also think that um, it won't die there <laughs> and it will be a lingering issue. Um, and I think it's really important that all sides of the issue are heard regardless of the outcome. Um, and that if further study is needed, we really should have a committee to dig into the details. Um, but I would absolutely support the will of the voters. Thanks. Uh, next question. Next question, I've got Casey Romero. There we go. There go. Um, yeah, question, uh, question for Evan. Uh, you mentioned failing infrastructure. Uh, could you explain what you meant? Uh, our bridges in, are in disrepair. Uh, a lot of culverts need some work. We have a lot of ditching and everything to do to come up to state regulations. Um, other than that, I, I view infrastructure as kind of a broader thing. Um, I mean, we don't have enough gravel <laughs> to keep maintaining our roads uh, as a town and that I would consider an asset. I know it's not infrastructure, so Hopefully I'm not crossing the line between those two things. Um, Scribner Bridge is a perfect example. Um, due to the COVID-19 virus going around, it got pushed off. There was funding there for that. But again, being proactive versus reactive uh, could have avoided, you know, if we could have got that pushed up and, and noticed what was going on ahead of time maybe we wouldn't be in this predicament with that particular scenario does that answer your question uh, i'm taking that to be a question directed to just one of the candidates or casey would you want me to have everyone else comment okay then next request for recognition okay I've got Greg Tatro up next. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to see we have so many interested candidates here. Um, I got a couple of questions. I guess one is um, Are you uh, for the four wheelers or against? And the second is uh, relating to the Black Lives Matter flag. Are you? Uh, supportive of where it is or would you support moving it to the uh, fire department so that's a question for all four please thank you uh, we'll go the other way around uh, Beth. uh hi greg thanks for the question for atvs um we've discussed but um 
I don't feel strongly either way. Um, personally, I have some concerns about ATVs in the village. Um, but that being said, I don't feel that I am educated enough um, or frankly feel strongly enough to um, make an uneducated decision there. So um, I don't have a position is what I guess I'll say, um, other than I understand the importance of ATVs to a large portion of our town. And I also understand the position of folks who um, have issue with ATVs or large groups of ATVs. I understand and see both sides. I am not in a position to make that decision for the town. I do think it's important that uh, we have all the facts behind and we make an informed decision. Um, in terms of the Black Lives Matter flag, um, again, probably an unpopular opinion, but um, I'm actually not for putting it at the post at the fire department because it is so divisive. Um, I think there are other ways to address it um, and uh, compromise. And what matters is the equity that we have for different people within our community, period. That matters a lot to, to me. Personally, I support Black Lives Matter on a personal front. Um, on a public front, we need to work together to make these to make change. Um, and we can do that in ways that do not make people within our community very upset. Um, we have public servants who are clearly very upset by the flag and the idea of the flag on the fire department pole. Um, and for that reason, I do not think it should be there. Michelle? So as an avid ATV rider, I am in fact in, in support of ATVs and what they have to offer. Um, it's one of the few things that our entire family can do together. Um, we can get outside and enjoy nature and pack a lunch and take off for the day and it virtually doesn't cost anything and we're all getting to enjoy the time together. I know it's not the most popular vote for recreation in this town, but for those of us that do it um, respectfully, because I'd like to think most of us are extremely respectful. Uh, it is a fantastic platform for families to enjoy time with each other. And it goes from, you know, elderly folks that maybe can't get out into the woods or can't go on trails anymore due to, you know, not being able to get around as well, mobility issues, um, down to just, you know, bringing children up to be respectful and responsible. Um, and I, I believe that ATVs have the potential to definitely boost um, businesses in the village. Um, I would be interested and I would actually love to see statistics from, you know, the, the months that the village is open this summer for how much income and revenue they bring in versus the months that in past years, they weren't there, maybe last year, because I think it's going to be a pretty similar COVID kind of year. Um, but it just, in, like I said, if, if not everybody wants them and that is what the vote comes down to, then, you know, it's not up to me to try to push my opinion on everybody. Um, so I think that pretty much covers that. Um, Black Lives Matter. I am not a supporter of having it um, on any town or village property, to be perfectly honest. It doesn't mean that I do, don't support what it stands for. I just believe that that, that should be public rep representation of our entire town. And I think anyone that personally wants to put it on their personal property to show their support, I absolutely think that that is a wonderful thing to do. I just don't think it should be the face of the community when you're coming or going. And thank you. Yeah. Me? No, it's Sophia. We're oh, sorry. Her mic turned on. Uh, I, I believe, Evan, I believe you're up. No, I was going for Sophia. Oh, Sophia? Yeah. I'm sorry, I had the order wrong. Thank you. 
Um, this is Sophia Berard. Um, Greg, if you were to ask me if I was for or against ATVs, I would say I am for ATVs. Um, I don't think I'm pro or anti. I'm kind of like Beth. I, I don't feel like I don't have a strong opinion. Um, well, I, I guess I do. I think that ATV riders should be able to ride in Vermont. I think they have been for decades. I think it's, I understand it's a super important recreation for people. Um, if you were to ask me if I'm for or against having a conversation around the usage of ATVs in Johnson, then I am for having the conversation. Um, I think that there's obviously a lot of people who feel very strongly about it. And I think that we can have a productive conversation where all sides are heard um, and come to a resolution that works best for the majority of people or, or everybody, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we um, should stay open to a conversation. Um, and I am for ATVs riding in Johnson. I Same with Beth, I have a little hesitation around them riding through the village, just safety concerns and whatnot. Um, but I'm also pro conversation. Um, as far as the Black Lives Matter flag goes, I do not think it should fly at the fire department. Um, I am happy where it's flying, but if it could be moved to the municipal building, I would support that. Um, I think Black Lives Matter is the bare minimum of a statement. And um, I think that if it were flying at the municipal building, it could be a statement that we strive for as a community. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Evan? Uh, as far as ATVs, uh, personally, I'm, I'm for them. I understand that there's some complications with some residents um, and some complaints. I've talked with uh, with quite a few club members, and um, you know they are trying to do what they can to meet in the middle. But maybe that could be uh, facilitated a little bit better. Uh, nobody's really talking about the positive things that they do. Uh, as far as green up day for our roads, which is great. Uh, I try to participate when I can in that, but they definitely beat me. Um, the money that they put into our class four roads being more than what we put into them. So that, that's kind of nice, the money that they donate to, to uh, you know charities. And they do spend some money at some businesses in the town and opening the village up will help that be more. I'm not saying they're the be all end all to bring a boatload of business to the town, but it's, you know, every little bit helps. And I also grew up here with it being a free and welcoming town and a town where the village and the town have both accepted the inclusivity statement. I think it's a little bit, uh, uh, how would I say it? It's, we're contradicting ourselves by saying we're an inclusive town except for you guys. Um, so there's gotta be somebody meeting in the middle. And I think the club is, is trying to do what they can to meet people in the middle. Uh, as for the Black Lives Matter flag, uh, I think that was a good compromise by the village to put it on the village green. Uh, I personally support the fire department and if my house catches on fire, I'd really like them to show up. Um, they're pillars of the community and they, they've been here for a long time. Uh, they live here too and I don't think that flying it on their flagpole should have been a question to start because that's really not fair. Um, but the town, the village did a good compromise. I know there's a little bit of hostility because they're having some trouble mobilizing that project. Um, I don't know if it's the pandemic or that the village only meets once a month versus twice where the select board does, but it was a good compromise. Okay. Ryan? All right, we've got Linda up next. Okay, um, this was a question for Eben. He talked about the industrial park and utilizing that and getting that up and going. Um, do you, you talked more about it than anybody else did. Do you have an idea of what you would like to see there? 
and how you would get a business there, how you would get something there, whatever it is that your vision is? Um, can I make a funny answer? Nobody's laughing. You can do it. Yeah, I'm ready. A for giant water funny. park. Oh, that's a good <laughs> idea. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, our, our town revenue is not incredibly high and we're extremely dependent on the state. Uh, in the college. So the only way that's really going to get off the ground is with state funding. Um, infrastructure needs to be there for businesses to want to be there. Developers need to be contacted and worked with um, to make them want to be a part of it. Uh, we do struggle some due to our geographic location. We're not next to an interstate. Uh, you know, a couple of businesses that wanted to be here in the past, Rock Art Brewery, uh, Butternut Mountain Farms. I, I really wish that that could have happened. I mean, I think Butternut Mountain Farms is employing over 150 people now. Um, and having 150 paying jobs is great. So the way to get that off the ground and moving uh, is to try to push more state funding, which kills me to say, because I'm an independent person that wants to do stuff on my own. But Given the revenue in the town, if you will, uh, from the tax base, I don't see where we can come up with millions of dollars for that. So we need some help. Well, Maybe other we than need... a water park, what type of business? Yeah, other than a water park, what type of business do you think would go could go up there? In an industrial park, uh, precast concrete. Um, the village rates of electricity are going up a little bit. I deal a lot with server farms. It's not a bad location because the village electricity is cheap um, for something of that matter. Unfortunately, it doesn't have the facade to, to put a brewery, but maybe some trees could be planted and stuff and worked out. I'd, I'd like to see a microbrewery. Um, the village does have a great asset with its um, wastewater system and they could take the capacity, especially if it's pre-treated. <laughs> Ideally, I'd love to see a microbrewery and, and something like that to start with and hopefully go from there more. Does that answer your question? I'm sure, sure. Does anybody else have, want to chime in on that? Uh. Um, Evan's point about not being near an interstate state is a really important one when we talk about manufacturing or wholesale. Um, so I just want to make that statement. And I think that if we are focused on manufacturing or wholesale companies, um, it, there are more attractive locations. Um, there are business types, um, white class businesses essentially, or small businesses that do things like graphic design or, um, software services or development or, other technology services, or even some even businesses that are starting up, like the HVAC systems that you know Evan works Evan works for, for example. Um, there are a lot of different types of supporting service uh, industries in the world that could um, fill the park. If we do not have very high speed internet, it will never happen. Um, so that is critically important. Sophia or Michelle, want to weigh in on that? No? Okay, next. Okay, next up, I've got uh, Eric. Thanks, Thank Brian. Ahead, Eric. Um, so in just yesterday's uh, VT Digger, there was an article about the amount that every town in the state paid for police services. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that the town of Elmore pays $41,000 a year for police services. The town of Cambridge pays $150,000 a year for police services. Uh, the much larger town of Waterbury pays $423,000 a year for police services, but, but Johnson pays uh, almost a half million dollars for police patrol. Um, and I'm wondering, do you folks know what we get out of that half million dollars? And would you be willing to reevaluate the amount we spend as there are local regional towns very similar to ours that spend 10 times less 
on their police services than we do. Well, she, uh, Beth? I wasn't sure if you're waiting for us to respond. Yeah, Eric, I, uh, I have the same concerns. Um, and I know that there's a, well, I don't know if it's called a task force. Sorry, Nat, I don't remember the name. <laughs> but I know that there's a group that is digging into um, the where we spend our money and how we spend our money. Um, the thing that always pops into my mind when we talk about how much we spend for the sheriff's department is how much we're spending on sheriff department cars. Um, they're doing all kinds of things with those cars, but does everyone need a car and do they all need a car as frequently as they get them? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe the answer is yes, maybe it's no, but that's a high expense item. Um, we have heard a lot from um, the, sheriff, the sheriff about um, the cost of bringing people on board and training efforts and that they don't retain um, their deputies. Um, they tend to go to other more high paying places, which is another area that just a flag pops in my mind because typically businesses spend a lot of money on salaries. Um, that's usually, unless you're in some high spend um, equipment type um, service, your highest uh, cost usually is and should be your employees. Um, so anyway, I share your concern with the amount of money we spend on the sheriff's department. I know there's an effort out there. I do think that there needs to be more critical thinking and exploratory thinking. And then I would also like to understand um, the emergency services um, because there's a different uh, budget for the sheriff's department itself. Sorry, I, I don't know the right terms, but there's a different budget for the sheriff's department itself and then the emergency services that are provided. And I know that there has been a statewide effort in consolidating some of those emergency services and I'd be interested to see how that impacts us. I think it's really interesting that Barrie is one of the towns that they serve and otherwise they're Lamoille County. Um, I don't know the answer to why, but it was just something that popped up in my mind. So yeah, I'm all for figuring out what we can do. So there. Um, yeah, I, I haven't read that article yet, Eric, but I definitely will after this. Um, that is definitely um, a concerning amount. And I echo what Beth said. And, and um, I would look forward to working with Roger Marcou and examining exactly what the costs are and working with the task force um, of community members that work with Roger Marcou and um, to talk about potentially reallocating funds or just kind of um, really exa closely examining how, um, how the Sheriff's Department can fully operate um, to what the community needs. So um, I would definitely as, as a select person be, be invested in, in looking into that number and figuring it out with the Sheriff. Michelle? So I'm definitely open to looking into different options. Um, I know the same subject came up, uh, well, quite a few years ago now. I like to think that I'm not as old as I am. So I think, oh, just recently, but it, it was years ago um, when we were looking into moving to state police. Um, I think my biggest concern with that would be that we are offered 24 hour coverage here. Um, we have folks that know where our houses are. We have folks that know the roads. They know where they're going. We're not waiting from a state police officer coming from St. Albans when, you know, somebody is breaking into your house. Um, but again, if there is, you know, a more sustainable way to get the same coverage that we're used to, um, through different means, then I would definitely be open to, you know, researching that. Absolutely. Uh, maybe it's something that Roger could explain better as to where the money specifically comes from and goes and why certain towns pay more than others. Um, but definitely it's, it's worth a discussion. Thank you. Kevin? 
quick answer to your question is not enough. <laughs> uh, you're asking how much coverage we get. Um, I don't know the exact, I know there's 24 hour emergency coverage, but the amount of hours that an officer spends time in this town per week, uh, I do not know. This is a difficult question because my sister um, was the head of dispatch for the sheriff's department for uh, a long time. Um, in the past, there's been talks about hiring the state police to shave this budget. Uh, unfortunately, due to the demographic of this town, uh, the state police won't touch it. So uh, there's definitely, I, I support responsible spending, but we need to keep the people of this community safe. And I do support the police station. Okay, next question. All right, I've got Cal up next. Yeah, hi, Cal Stanton. Uh, just to, for a break in the action here. Um, well, first, thanks everyone for, for uh, considering running for the select board. Um, but I really just uh, am on here to make sure that the record is straight with all the talk of the Black Lives Matter flag um, at the fire department. That is simply not true. The original proposal was have the Black Lives Matter flag at the municipal building. There was never any, the narrative that's been propagated around the Black Lives Matter flag at the fire department is false. And I just wanna make sure that Donna gets that on record so that we don't continue to this false narrative. Um, and that's it, I have no questions. Thank you everyone for running, but I wanna make sure that that got in there for record's sake. Thanks all. Okay, thank you, Cal. Next. I've got uh, D and, I clicked the wrong button on D. Okay, let's try and go ahead, D. No, her mic's still muted. There we go. Okay. So Don, Don wants to ask a question. Is that okay? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, this is a kind of a general question in a way. Um, I think the world is very different. The kinds of businesses we have are different. And I would like to hear some discussion about investigating uh, or making a possible uh, list of growth businesses that would be compatible with the big businesses we already have, such as um, the College of Studio Art Center, Laraway School, um, and a bunch of other smaller people-oriented businesses. Um, because I think that people are talking about growth in the village, and what we should probably be doing is spending more time thinking about the kind of growth that we should get and the kind of growth that the village would uh, be able to attract. So, the, um, and then the other question that I would like to have people address is whether or not um, four wheelers would be incompatible with certain of the businesses we already have, such as the Studio Art Center and uh, the kind of image that it might create uh, in the in the village itself, um, because um, there might be some businesses that would actually be harder harder to attract if we had uh, four wheelers um, in the village. I'm not sure. So, any comments about uh, any of that from People running. Um, <clears throat> Beth had her hand up, so we'll go there. Um, hold on. Beth, so, in terms of growth and compatibility, um, I think that's a really good question, and your point is a very good one. That we need to bring in good jobs, not just any jobs, and good businesses, not just any business, 
because if we're bringing in business with low paying jobs, we are not growing um, our community in the way we need to because we can't add another restaurant or another store or another retail business um, to the general public if we do not have the people with the income to support those businesses. So um, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, and I do think that, you know, some of the things that I was talking about earlier with the business industries that are service oriented indus industries and the white collar, I think that's, that's critically important. So there's a few blockers that could potentially be in the way and internet is one of those big blockers. We need to get that out of the way. Um, it, and it doesn't have to be big business. It could be that we are um, attracting, well, first thing, networking is important and we need to have the right people involved and developers have connections is I guess one thing I would say. So if we're looking for somebody who's going to develop the um, properties that we have in town, we should be, and we have a choice in the matter, we should be very critical about who those developers are and what their connections are and what type of people and business they can bring. Um, but anyway, that aside, that's assuming they're medium or large businesses. That aside, we should be looking at um, um, internet-based uh, white collar um, jobs that will bring in good pay and frankly get more um, owner-occupied um, housing in Johnson too. Our owner-occupied numbers from that merger study, like those are pretty low numbers. Um, and I think that should be very concerning to all of us um, for a number of reasons. And one of which is we're not going to be a growth community or a viable community if we don't have more owner-occupied um, properties. Um, so anyway, um, graphic design, um, software development, um, any of those technology-based companies can be very small companies. They can be two, three, five, seven, 15 people, um, but they also can bring in good money and attract other companies, like-minded companies, and loop in things like um, supporting Laraway with some of their technical challenges as um, an offering to the community. Um, maybe it's a, a tax break for them uh, as a charitable service they provide. I do think there are plenty of companies out there and there will continue to be. And COVID unfortunately may be a good opportunity for that as um, businesses suffer. It means that there will be more entrepreneurship. Um, so now is the time we need to get cracking. Uh, in terms of the four-wheeler impact on our community, I mean, like I said, I'm not well educated. Your guess is as good as mine. There probably is an impact, yes. We probably do need to better understand what that impact could be. Uh, sorry, I'm not gonna give you a good answer on that one. Michelle, would you like to get in on that? So the first part of the question, I absolutely agree with everything that Beth just had to say. Uh, right on the money. We need to be very selective about the businesses that come to our town. We need to be selective about who, who is here to, to support those businesses and what attracts them here. Um, we definitely have a lot of properties in the village and spaces in the town where viable businesses could move in. Um, again, I agree. I don't think it should just be anybody that wants to come set up shop, here you go, let's see how it works. I think they, they need to fit into the community um, and offer a service for you know the majority of the folks that live here, not just a certain group. Um, as far as the ATVs go, that's a tough one for me because I told you all my view before. Um, would it impact some businesses? I'm, I'm sure it would, and I'm sure it would impact them adversely. Um, there's also the other businesses that I feel it would help greatly. Um, that, you know, the only thing I can compare it to is, you know, you got a group of Harley Davidson motorcycles coming through the village and they all decide to pull in in front of, you know, the downtown to have a pizza. They're noisy, they're loud, there's motorcycles everywhere. And I, I don't see how that pushes people away from wanting to go in and eat or, you know, stop in the village. So I guess I, I don't have a solid answer. Um, that's just my opinion. Thank you. 
seven. Cool. Sorry, we seem to be going in and out of order. Um, types of businesses, uh, Beth brings up a good point. Um, there is certain types of manufacturing businesses that are needed for local use too though. Uh, and like I originally said, our geographic location makes it difficult, but I've seen it in other towns too. So I know the right candidate will be there. Um, it is very difficult to sit here and say that we want business and only this specific business, but I would definitely champion uh, a more representable business that uh, has a better business plan that's financially viable um, over another business because I want what's best for the town. Uh, as far as impacts uh, on the village and businesses from ATVs, I think that would be difficult to guess. Uh, it, it could be positive, very, very positive. Um, some of our small businesses could get a lot more support. There could be support at the grocery store, at restaurants, uh, more support at gas stations. Um, possibly if we were able to get a business in uh, that needed a high flow of traffic, we could work with the Green Mountain Club uh, on changing a route so that four wheelers aren't in the way. Uh, of regular everyday life. Uh, for the most part, uh, your heavier ATV use is on the weekends and your heavier manufacturing white collar graphic design, uh, IT work, uh, unless you're Bitcoin mining, is done during the week. So the two don't have a heavy overlap period um, in terms of business and recreation. Uh, there is some overlap for sure, but as far as affecting flow of things, the predominant amount of use are at different times. Sophia? Um, yeah, I, um, I, would, I would agree with um, what's been said here and also that the internet issue in town um, definitely holds us back from getting some certain businesses um, to locate here in Johnson. So I think that's a major issue to address um, when deciding what businesses to attract to town. Um, I, as far as other growth businesses um, in town, I mean, this just popped into my head, but like thinking of what we already have on Main Street and what could potentially be impacted by four wheelers use. Um, I mean, I'm, it, it's, it's hard to say, hard telling not knowing. Um, I think we would have to kind of, um, I think we would have to, we would have to, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, I think we would have to see what kind of businesses were around. And like Eben just said, like a lot of businesses operate during the week. ATVs are recreational things, so um, I can't really speak to that as, as an individual. I would look forward to working with, with the group to um, figure out how that, how that would work or how that may or may not affect the town. Thanks. And Brian? All right, next up, I've got uh, Jess Bickford. Hello, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I think this is a really important discussion. Um, so one of the, the great things about our community is we have a kind of burgeoning, bur can't say that right. Anyways, a growing uh, recovery community. And, you know, they're investing a lot in our community and revitalizing Main Street. So what do you all as potential select board members see your role as supporting uh, the recovery community and creating a recovery friendly town? And uh, thank you. No, I go the other way around, Evan. Evan? Um, I, I mean, we, we do have a, a growing recovery community in this town. I think Jenna's Promise has done a great job um, and getting the footwork down there and getting a path laid. Uh, I believe that their plan is to grow and support more people, but um, 
I'm sure somebody else on this call could probably answer that better. Uh, as a select board member, I support them. Uh, I mean, as a person, I'm not a select board member. My apologies. Um, but I would support them um, <laughs> in continuing the good work that they're doing. Uh, they're putting money into the village um, and supporting people. I, I have friends in, that I went to high school with uh, right at Lamoille that are stealing stuff to pay for, pay for a habit and be good to see them turn a new leaf and, and have a path for that you know does that answer the question yes um sophia um yeah that's it's funny that just rejogged one of the businesses in town that i was thinking of was so looking forward to having was jenna's promise cafe um right in town as as one of the many attractions um, to add to the list of things we have going for us on Main Street. Um, I fully support the, um, the, the Gen of Promise mission and um, I'm every day I'm learning more and more about clinical mental health and about substance abuse and substance use disorders. Um, so I am personally invested in the rehabilitation Seen, I am personally invested in um, aiding the the community, um, and as a select board member, I would bring that uh, to the town as well. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I think um, what Greg and Don are doing is fantastic. I think it's a great resource for us to have here. It's definitely becoming a greater need in this area. Um, and the fact that the, the design of it is to help folks actually become a viable part of the community um, and make them feel like they can move forward and they, they can be better than what they were. Um, I, I, I think that's very important and I would absolutely be in support of, in support of it 100% along with programs that would kind of go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you. Beth? Sure. Um, so I don't think anyone is opposed to having substance dependent people <laughs> become undependent people. Um, and I think Jessica, just my witnessing what the work you've done and your organization has done um, in conjunction with the town, not only in support of Jenna's Promise, but also in other initiatives like um, tobacco free rec fields, for example. Um, I think as long as the town is working with um, supporting organizations of, you know, not only substance abuse, but any social issue, um, that's what matters. It does matter. Uh, it makes a difference. So that's my answer. Brian? Thanks. And next up, I've got Eric. Okay, go ahead, Eric. Sure, no one else has got a question. I don't, I don't, I, this is my third. This is my third go around. You guys, I'll take as much space as you give me here. But um, so uh, I, you know, as a member of the town, you know, the Mutual Racial Justice Committee, you know, I've been doing some research, and um, according to census data, the, the white population of Vermont has decreased one percent over the last ten years, but the percentage of people of color in our state has increased ninety percent. So if we want to grow our town and grow our population and attract businesses, it occurs to me that one of the obstacles to that is if, if you have a very, very white area, that makes it less attractive to people of color to move there. So uh, as members of the select board, would you be in favor of tax breaks or financial incentives or other efforts and outreach to attract people of color and businesses owned by people of color to our community uh, in meaningful meaningful, resourceful ways. Okay, well, I start with uh, Michelle. Um, I would say I would not be in support of that. Um, I, I feel that every person should have the same breaks and the same incentives as anyone else. Um, I, I really don't know how to answer it without sounding absolutely terrible, which is not my intention. Um, I just feel like, you know, we've all lived here and we've people have 
been able to come in and break businesses in and to give one specific dynamic a tax break or incentives it it just it doesn't sit well and and I'm sorry if that's not a popular answer but that's that's my opinion thank you um sure I'm all for incentives of bringing any um any population frankly um that could bring business to our town I would gladly look at and weigh out um those options um I would want to hear more about it I think rather than just saying a flat out yes um but sure I would absolutely consider it um and in terms of bringing populations into the town I think on an individual basis I think that gets a little bit hairy um I'm not sure I would be quite as supportive about um incentive to move here um, if it wasn't tied to bringing um, business or some other um, asset to the town other than an individual. However, um, I do think that we already have some pretty important assets in town that do bring diversity, cultural um, and racial diversity to our town. Um, and those uh, right off the top of my head are MVU and the Studio Center. Um, and I'm sure there are others. So I think that those are really good avenues to bring individuals in and we should very much support them in their efforts in bringing um, that cultural and racial diversity. Um, uh, I would support tax breaks uh, on bringing any business into town. Uh, it's hard for me to see it um how you're how you worded it um because if we go out of our way to specifically give tax breaks to uh, a specific uh group of people but we leave other groups of people out it, it gets hairy um i work a lot with members of the gay and lesbian community those didn't really seem to be mentioned in your uh in your question so I would support tax breaks to bring business into town um, and they should be equal opportunity employers. As a child, I would have been hit if I asked a question based on somebody's skin color. Um, everybody's equal, we all breathe the same air. So um, business, yes, uh, personal homes, I don't think I would support tax breaks on anybody building. Uh, a personal resident. Um, I, I want people to feel welcome and I want them to want to be here um, across the board. Sophia? Hi, Sophia Berard. Um, uh, I guess, Eric, I, I've, I've heard this before. I'm a active participant with the Racial Justice Committee. I'm not on the committee, but I attend all the meetings. Um, and while I would want to discuss this option with the rest of the select board, I am in support of recommendations that come from the Racial Justice Committee, or I would be, um, and I would be in support of, of tax breaks and incentives to get more racially diverse populations to our town. I think it's important as, um, as white people that we um, help give representation to marginalized and oppressed people. And I think that by tax breaks and, and incentives, I think that that is um, a way that we can, can work towards racial justice and equity for all marginalized people. Brian? All right, thank you. I have a question from Doug. You're on. I am on. Um, I am wondering if there was evidence that there was interest in uh, owner occupied housing construction of that uh, off of Clay Hill and in the Gould in the Gould uh, Hill area that loop there uh, would uh, and would the candidates be interested in an expansion of the town sewer service area into that for purposes of uh, 
if there were soil limitations there and, and providing a, a more buildable, close to the village, close to the college type of housing. Evan? You're on. Um, I guess that's a tricky question, Doug, because the sewer department is owned by the village. Uh, it, if it could be facilitated, um, and the town and the village seem to work pretty well, but I don't know how the town would pay for infrastructure that the village can build for. Um, it would be something great to champion and something interesting to figure out how you would properly meter it and everything and, and have your own subset of employees to maintain that. Um, I'm not against expanding the wastewater system. I just don't see where the town can come in and own a portion of what the village owns and already maintains. I think it'd be confusing, but um, I definitely recommend that the village did it, if that makes sense. Uh, Sophia? Um, yeah, I guess I, I definitely don't know enough about this to be able to come up with an answer right now. I would be open to discussion and figuring out if it could work and um, how it could work in conjunction with the village or, um, or just run by the town or if the people who live there paid for it. So uh, I think there's a lot of variables that would need to be examined, um, but I'm open to the discussion. Hey, Beth. Um, my short answer is um, it depends on how it's paid for. Um, I don't think it should be paid for by all of the residents of Johnson or frankly, the residents of the village. Um, and it would have to be facilitated through the village if the village is the one who keeps um, responsibility for the, the sewer. Michelle? I guess I don't have enough information or I'm not quite as familiar with this as um, other folks are. And I would need, I guess I'd need to hear both sides of whatever was gonna come about, um, how it would affect the town versus the village and what impacts it would have on both. Um, and again, like financially, how it would impact all of us. So I guess I would say I would need some more information before making an informed decision. Thank you. Brian? All right, I've got Linda Hill up next. Okay, go ahead, Linda. Um, I sort of, it's sort of a question and sort of a comment at the same time. Um, being on the select board is a huge commitment. And um, I just am curious as to whether or not, um, some of you are aware that it's two meetings a month. There's lots of information coming to you throughout the month. And the current select board, very rarely is there somebody not at a meeting. Um, that all the members show up every time. Um, and it's much easier to do it during Zoom, with a Zoom meeting. But when select board meetings start showing up in person again, um, I guess I'd, I'm curious as to whether you are really committed and really are going to be able to be at every single meeting um, twice a month. And with all the uh, reading and upkeep there is to be on top of things when the meeting does come up. Um, I don't care who you start with. This is just a general across the board comment question. Well, I've, I've been pointing at people, but now I got a volunteer, so I'll go with that. Uh, Sophia? Sorry, who was that first? Sophia. Sophia, okay. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I, I would say I'm aware of the commitment. I've been attending select board meetings for a while now, um, and as well as been on um, two other committees for a number of years, two or three years, I think each. 
um, the Tuesday Night Live committee and the oven committee. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I've been going to the meetings without even being on the select board. So I would say I'm committed to, to showing up um, and serving the community in that way, in that way, excuse me. Thank you, uh, Evan. Uh, I've attended all but one uh, select board meeting uh, for quite some time now. I, I'd have to look back. Um, it, it is quite an equipment uh, commitment uh, to, to have two nights a month. Uh, in addition to all the literature you have to read to become educated. Um, growing up, I was never allowed to quit anything, and I was always told to do the best at, you know, what you're trying for. So I wouldn't be standing here asking for uh, people's support in a vote um, if I wasn't ready to commit that time. Beth? Um, I tend to commit my life to, to not my life, but other people's. So yeah, not, not a problem here. Okay. Michelle? Um, I grew up with a father that was on the Johnson Select Board most of my entire childhood. Um, I used to see the stuff that he would read through and I know times have changed, but I am very aware of the commitment that it takes. Um, and as I said earlier, I have chosen not to be involved very much in the community or stuff outside of my home responsibilities um, until I'm confident that my children are old enough now and I can dedicate the time to it. Um, and that's, that's kind of why I've waited so long to kind of step in and see if I can do something to help. And I definitely wouldn't have done it if I didn't think I could commit. That was a great question, Linda. Thank you. Ryan? All right, up next we've got Greg. Go ahead, Greg. We talked a lot about the, the things going on here, or have gone on. I'm, I'm wondering from each candidate, what do you see for the future of Johnson? And, and when you tell us about your vision, how, how, how are you gonna get there? You know, um, it's easy to come up with things but a lot of times when you have to implement them that's that's the tough part we all have a lot of ideas so um i'm looking for what you think johnson's good what your vision is for johnson and how we're gonna how you're gonna implement it to uh to make it come true thank you and by the way you guys are all doing a great job uh, it's very interesting and uh we're uh we're gonna be a better town here for uh whoever gets on this board you're very you're all qualified and good people thank you uh, Beth sure I think we've um I think we've talked a lot about this Greg actually uh and not directly about it but partnerships that like you can't do anything by yourself um so my vision of Johnson is having um those businesses that we keep talking about coming in and having our village homes be primarily uh, owner occupied homes and our town homes being primarily uh, owner occupied also, um, not solely, but primarily. Um, and my vision is having those empty storefronts populated because the um, industrial jobs or the, um, uh, the white collar jobs are supporting the retail business out there. So um, my vision is to uh, bring in, we have to support internet. Like there's no two ways around it. We have to support internet. So um, bringing in those internet services, we should not be saying no to anything and we should not be narrow-minded in the way we think about um, what the options are. We should be thinking we should be shooting at the wall and thinking about crazy ideas um, and then playing out what sticks to get internet here um, and to make us very attractable to businesses. Um, but once we get that um, and we can get our footing with getting these bigger businesses in, it cascades from there. Um, it really impacts all areas of life. Um, and frankly, Jenna's promised revitalizing some of our older buildings as part of that. Um, it takes 
and the, the studio center revitalizing our buildings or getting rid of the buildings that can't be um, built up. Like those little things matter. Um, and we need to partner with whoever we can part with it, partner with as a town um, and support that growth. So I think partnership is the key um, and al alongside internet. Michelle? Well, it's kind of hard to answer that question without making my answer sound like everybody else's, um, even though that's the only one that went. I think we all, all four of us probably have the same vision, which is, um, you know, just get businesses in, um, make it a desirable place to live, to move to, to raise your kids here, to, to stay here. Um, revitalizing like the, the buildings that, you know, the half burnt buildings. I know that there's stuff going on with them that just getting everything kind of back up to, you know, the beautiful little community that it was. Um, and we are definitely well on our way to that. There have been so many things done um, from the items that Beth mentioned, just to the beautification with the trees and the flowers and things such as that, like that, that's all part of step-by-step step to get to kind of what I think everyone that lives here wants to see. Um, how would I make that happen? It would, it would have to be more than just me. It would have to be everyone wanting to pitch in and everyone wanting to work together to, to bring it to light. Um, and I would hope that everyone would be willing to step up and do that. Cause I think it's kind of a general consensus and I hope I'm not over speaking by saying that, but I can't imagine who wouldn't want to move forward in that direction. So then. Um, yeah, I, my vision for Johnson, I mean, post pandemic, I see families walking down main street. I see, you know, every window full with business, um, businesses from home businesses in other locations other than main street. Um, and yeah, I think Beth really hit the nail on the head. We can't do this alone. None of us can do it alone. We definitely need to um, lean on our partnerships with the big businesses in town, Studio Center, the college, um, Laraway, and and we need to work. Um, just communication is key. We need to stay connected. We need to um, work together to to make this vision happen. But I think we can, and I think it will. Um, so. I look forward to getting there. I look forward to the journey of that destination vision point. Thanks. Evan? I get to be the fourth echo. <laughs> um, I'd like to see um, some businesses rejuvenate downtown for sure. Uh, I'd like to, like I've said several times, get the industrial park underway, but we're very dependent on the state there. Uh, I'd really like to see um, agritourism a little bit, the agricultural portion of this community, uh, as far as dairy farms go, is waning uh, for sure. It has been for years, but there's other types of ag agriculture. Um, and agritourism is great for foot traffic. Uh, I'd like to see Johnson be a town that people can go to and get married, um, have a nice wedding venue and, and stuff like that too. Um, but you bring up a good point. Uh, mobilization is very difficult. Um, I'd, I'd like to tell you that tomorrow 52 businesses are going to come into town and our tax base is going to quadruple and, and everything like that, but it's going to take time for sure. Um, and time also comes with some stones that need to tumble and, and maybe go a different route with businesses first. Um, maybe Getting businesses downtown would take priority over over getting businesses somewhere else or supporting our, our ag. What I would like to see is more agritourism. Uh, a lot of that falls on on the person in the agricultural business, but I'd like to see it become something that people want to do to get more foot traffic as well. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Okay, Ryan. All right, next up, I've got Cal. Okay, go ahead, Cal. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, respectfully, Brian, do you mind if I defer to Jack, Jackie, who can't raise her digital hand right now for some reason? Oh, sure. Sorry, man. Thanks. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's so good to be with you tonight. This is a wonderful event. Um, I really just wanted to speak um, to, to acknowledge that we're all of us tonight here in Johnson participating in an historic event. Uh, we have three women running for select board this year, uh, and I want to draw attention to that. This is an unprecedented event. Uh, this is progress. And I, I'm grateful to you. Um, I'm celebrating you. And I want to say that out loud and proud. Um, so that's all that I want to say, celebrating with you all tonight. If any of uh, the candidates uh, want to comment on that, uh, you're free to or not. Thanks, everybody. Evan? Mine's a fun comment. If your digital hand is broke, what doctor do you go to? Next, someone to top that one. Uh, Sophia. Um, I just thank you, Jackie, for bringing that up. It definitely is uh, an honor to be sitting here with Michelle and Beth. And um, I just really appreciate you, you bringing that progress forward. So thank you for your comment. Beth? Um, and hopefully this inspires other women to <laughs> seek leadership roles in other ways. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Michelle? Thank you for recognizing that it hadn't even occurred to me, honestly, as I was sitting here, that this is kind of an interesting and unique year. So it's awesome that you just pointed that out. Thank you. Brian. All right. Next up, we've got Eric Osgood. Okay, uh, first of all, Linda was not supposed to tell you how much time and commitment there is to serve on the select board. We want you to run. Uh, one of the non-binding articles before the voters is a question on shall the select board enter into discussions with the village trustees on a possible town village merger. There's a consultant's report in the end of the town report my question is, have you read the re consultant's report and what are your thoughts on a town village merger question? Sophia? Yes, thank you, Eric. Um, I have read the report. I will say I'll probably have to read it again to really um, to really get all the, all the facts and details down. Um, I, you know, I think that there's still a lot to be discussed around it. I think that there's a lot of different ways that the town and village could merge. Um, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense financially, like there's no huge benefit. Um, so I think uh, really, I don't, I think that there's so many different configurations that um, that it would, it would take um, more conversation to figure out exactly um, how, if, and when, and in what capacity that we would merge, or if at all. Thanks. Emma? I did read it. I've uh, read some other stuff since, so probably not all of it stuck in there. Um, they did commend the town and the village for working well together, not having a lot of overlapping expenses. Uh, which is great. I do support the idea of one governing body um, to make it easier for the citizens. I mean, just earlier there was a question asked about the sewer and it was a difficult one to maneuver. Uh, that being said, I think the town has some other more pressing things, um, you know, ensuring that we can have gravel for, for our road maintenance uh, and stuff like that, that really should be dealt with because they can be extremely costly if we don't take care of them. Um, and a lot of the tax, the extra cost if it's not taken care of falls on the taxpayers. Um, I do support it and I do support the discussion to continue. I don't think it could happen right now because uh, there's 
some other things going on that, that should be taken care of to make sure that the town people are provided for. Michelle? So right off the bat, I have not read that section of the town report. So I do not have um, all the information to, to give an honest answer. Um, I guess I'm not familiar with the complete financial one way or the other. Um, I would say my current position is I, I feel like they, they should just stay separate. Um, but again, I, I don't know the complete data on it. Um, and I would be open to, you know, listening to it or researching it, or even just reading the section in the town report so that I know a little bit more about it. Um, but I guess my, my opinion and my stance right now is um, I, I think financially for both from what I do understand and what I have read up, read up on um, is it, it's better to not merge. And that, that, that I guess is my answer. Uh -huh. Um, I think we should continue with discussions solely based on how the votes come in, uh, is my, uh, diplomatic answer. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to stick to. However, I did, uh, explain my personal opinion in the article that we're all in, in the news and citizen that went out today or yesterday or whenever it was. Um, and I, going into the talks, I was, um, very much for merging, um, and I'll, uh, the reason for that was because the perception that I had, um, and I still think it was true at the time, um, was that there was not a great collaboration between the town and village um, on some issues that probably could have been more collaborative. Um, but that being said, I'm personally going to vote no, that we do not continue discussions. I do think that it is critically important um, that we work together to figure out where additional savings and efficiencies can be gained. There's always room for efficiencies and to say there aren't areas where efficiencies can be found is never a true statement. It doesn't matter the context in my book. Um, so. Ron? All right, next up, I've got Mark Woodward. Am I unmuted? You are. Perfect. Um, first, thank you all the candidates. I really appreciate you coming out and doing this. I, it's not easy to do. Um, my major concern for Johnson right now is in NVU. And I, I know Johnson bringing the, the old normal school to town in the beginning of it. And I wonder if you could um, share a little bit about what role you see the select board playing in keeping NVU active and in town. I know they, and Brian will support me, they pay a lot of taxes to the town and without NVU, I think we lose most of our businesses. So I would like to hear a little about what you think the role of the select board is in keeping NVU in town. Thank you. I have a volunteer to go first on that one, Beth. Um, sure. So I talk about NVU a lot, <laughs> as you know. Um, I think that the town should be supportive in helping NVU with partnerships that they're going to continue to need. Um, I share your concern, Mark. Um, NVU's, they're in a much better place than they were a year ago, but they're still not in a good place, and we shouldn't pretend they are. Um, we need to do everything we can to support them in terms of uh, individually, as in terms of the town and the village impact. And I think that we need to make sure that we are openly and honestly and loudly communicating with all of the stakeholders inv um, involved in the future of NVU and the state college system. Um, so that's the first statement. And what do we do to support that? I think that we need to make sure that we do have those open and honest conversations um, with more than just administration. Um, I think we need to have them with the administration at NVU, but I think we also need to have them 
um, with the different types of parties at NVU. I think we need to have them with the uh, faculty and staff and students and everyone else involved because um, we can get them more involved in our day-to-day -day activities, you know, regardless of the area. Maybe it's volunteerism, maybe it's connecting them with somebody like um, Dennis Promise, maybe it's connecting them with somebody like a brewery or some other learning opportunities. Um, but I think that there are ample opportunities um, and we can help with those. Um, and I think we can also help with um, supporting some of the um, revolving fund. Maybe we can partner with some graduates that are coming out and trying to start a small business. I think the opportunities are limitless, really. Michelle? My answer is very short and very simple. Um, NBU is an extremely vital part of our community. Uh, it brings a lot to our town. It's vital that we keep it here, we do everything we can to keep it here and help them. And with anything, I guess the biggest takeaway is communication because open communication is the absolute necessity to make anything successful. And I think between the town and all aspects of NBU, as long as the line of communication is open and we can help them and they can help us, um, I, I think that's pretty much the best we can do. Evan? Can you hear me? Somebody said I was glitchy. No, I can, I've been able to hear you. In fact, your mic seems to be open. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a tough one. I, I totally support open communication um, and supporting students where we can. Uh, it, it is its own entity. I mean, I'm sure if you uh, read the or watched the Channel 3 News, they said that the City Council of Burlington sent a letter to UVM saying that they condemn the $8.8 .8 million budget cut, but they have no actual say. Um, I do whatever I could to keep it in this community. And it's kind of sad to me um, that it got to this point uh, because I, I work in the majority of the colleges in the state and they all knew that enrollment was going down a long time ago. And the ones that are flourishing now were proactive instead of reactive. Um, so I, I do fully support them staying and I would be more than happy to talk to anybody in administration, faculty, teachers, anything like that. Um, and I would, you know, send letters to our local representatives and everything. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the taxpayers have a voice. Uh, we don't have the money to prop that college up. Yeah. Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, I'm a grad student at NVU and last year, um, it was right around the time that I got accepted that the news hit that it was potentially closing and that was a whirlwind of a day. Um, so I, I think it's, I totally echo what Beth said. I think we need to really instill strong partnership with the college and, um, and be loud about our support for the college and I think we need to do whatever we can to sustain it because it's a huge part of our community. Um, so I think, yeah, making sure there's a clear partnership between the college and the town and working with them, with everybody um, up at the college to, to make sure that they stay and they succeed um, is really important for our town. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all, thank you. No. I just want to make one clarification. I use the term stakeholders. And so I'm just going to use this platform to advocate a little bit. We really do need to be loud. And by stakeholders, I mean um, all the people here. I mean the um, board of trustees, the Vermont State College Board of Trustees needs to keep hearing from all of us here. Um, the governor needs to hear from us. Legislators need to hear from us. Everybody needs to hear from us. Um, so. Uh, at the state level. Um, and just a clarification, um, uh, Eben, UVM is a quasi-public institution. They're not quite in the same boat as NBU, so I just want to point that out. But thanks. 
Anyone like to respond to that? You mean me? Well, anyone, you're. Oh, <laughs> thanks for the clarification, Beth. Uh, I, I knew that, but it's still a separate entity. I do wholeheartedly support the communication and voicing everything. Um, and if there was different plans made in the past, maybe they wouldn't be in this scenario. Um, I, I want them to stay at the end of the day. Brian? All right, next up I've got Cal. Okay, go ahead, Cal. Uh, defer to Jackie again, Brian, sorry. That's all right. All right. Okay, there's Jackie. Thank you, Brian, and sorry, Calvin, sorry, everybody. Um, so, so while some of you will become uh, our, our future select board members and be concerned with the business of the town, we're of course, uh, you know, part of the state of Vermont. We have some great folks representing us, um, uh, Kate Donnelly, Dan Noyes. And, and so my question is, uh, do you know them? Do you have relationships with them? Will you be using them as a resource uh, in your role as uh, select board members? Okay, Sophia. Um, I I really really like Dan and Kate. They would come to some of the Monday night bakes this past summer, so I've gotten to know them just as far as being in the community and being um, visible and active in the community. Um, and yeah, I I like them. I I can see working with them. I can see reaching out to them if need be. I'm very open to that relationship with Dan and Kate. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Evan? Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know them uh, very well. I'd be interested in getting to know them. Uh, I know Westman a little bit, but. Okay, uh, Beth? Um, so I give them all a hard time. <laughs> I don't need to be on the select board for it. Uh, <laughs> so yes, I do know them uh, at various uh, levels of degree of, of, no of knowledge, but um, I do reach out to them. I actually reach out to them on NVU quite often. And most recently I have reached out to them on internet service and Comcast instituting their um, um, storage capacity during COVID a pandemic, which I was not very impressed with. So yes, we've been in, I've been in com communication with all of them as well as some surrounding, um, surrounding <laughs> representatives. Michelle? Although I do not know them, um, I would absolutely be open to asking them for assistance or reaching out to them for advice or any questions that I might come across. Um, at that, as a representative, I, I don't feel like I would need to know them personally to feel comfortable reaching out to them as they, are, they ran to kind of represent everybody like we're all trying to do here. And I would hope that nobody would ever hesitate to reach out to me if there was a question or a concern. All right, I don't have anybody up in the queue right now. Um, I might have missed some hands if you had physically raised your hand to speak. Uh, I've done my best to keep an eye on that, but I haven't seen very many today. And uh, I'll remind you that if you're on the telephone, uh, you dial star nine to uh, virtually raise your hand. It looks like we might be wrapping up tonight. Well done. Well done to you all, questioners and answerers and uh, uh, yes. Brian, I thought you were buying, buying us all pizza. Say again? I thought the town was buying us all pizza. <laughs> that was part of the deal here. Yeah, we won't have uh, uh, Mark to provide pizza for us from the uh, our oven this year. 
I think Mark's got to reply to that, but I am going to reply to that. There's I'm I'm going to fire up the oven this winter, come hell or high water, and hopefully not high water. Um, so it, I'll post it, and we'll we'll get some pizzas out to people so, sometime. Not town meeting day though. Any other uh, community discussion that anybody would like to have here? Seeing none, um, unless someone you know waves their hands violently in the air, I guess uh, we've uh, we've concluded uh, this candidates meeting, uh, and I will again congratulate uh, everyone for their, their participation and uh, the, the, the kind of better angels that uh, you know, we have in Johnson and uh, you folks are the, are the best of the best. Thank you and good night. Yeah. Thank you everybody. everybody. Um, don't forget you can drop off your ballots at town hall anytime. Uh, we've got the drop box outside and uh, you can vote in person on town meeting day. Oh, we've got one more comment. Beth? And you have to request your school ballot if you want to vote on the school budget items. So request your school ballot. Yes, thank you. Uh, oh, yes, I've got a comment from Nat or yes. is he waving goodbye? I just wanted to say thank you to David Williams. You always do a fabulous job for us and uh, we uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, David. Good night. Thanks again, everybody.